Uh, good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to day two of the uh, annual scientific meeting of the School for Public Health Research and our celebration of 10 years of the school. The first part of today focuses on our research capacity development programme, and I'm just going to briefly outline for you the different components of that. But before I do that, um, we have um, some uh, housekeeping that we need to uh, go through. So I'm just going to share my screen with you now um, and take you through those. So if you just bear with me for a moment. So um, just to remind you that uh, Beacon events are online and um, in the chat function to uh, help you uh, with any technical difficulties that you have. They are called the organizers. So please do get in touch with you if you're having any issues. Um, to remind those of you who came yesterday and for those of you uh, who are just joining us today, there are four main areas in the platform. There's the reception area, the foyer area, where you can view the program, um, the stage where we are now, uh, the people part where you can take part in speed networking and the expo area where we are showcasing uh, the 10 years of our work. So do, do visit that uh, when the program allows. Um, do make sure that you get the most out of the ASM by uh, exploring all the areas of the platform um, and joining in the conversation. Um, please do interact with our speakers um, through the chat function, which is called comments. Um, and when you're posting questions for them, if you can proceed the question with a queue, that makes them easier to spot. Um, the Twitter hashtag is there for you to use. Um, and do take time to interact uh, with everyone at the conference by networking. And also, um, please do visit um, the booths where all our trainees um, are there waiting to speak to you. And finally, just to say, um, please give us our feed, your feedback after the conference because that's just incredibly helpful to us when it comes to planning future events. So as I said, I was just going to outline a little bit of our research capacity development program. Uh, and because we're celebrating 10 years, I just wanted to start by uh, mentioning what happened in the first quinquennium, where in fact we had no explicit funding or remit for research capacity development, but nevertheless, we thought it was incredibly important. And so uh, the members at that time uh, managed to leverage 10 PhD students. Um, and you can see what happened uh, to those PhD students uh, in the lozenge there. Um, and we also started piloting uh, what we call two-year apprenticeship schemes, which was the precursor to our now uh, pre-doctoral fellowships. Um, and you can see there what uh, those folk went on to do. And importantly, we also established our Early Career Researcher Network, ResNet. Um, and I'm delighted to say that 100% um, of um, our trainees at that stage um, all went on to work in public health in some capacity or other. So moving forward to uh, the second quinquennium, um, we were incredibly fortunate and delighted to be awarded £3.9 million specifically for a programme of research capacity development. And the various elements of that programme are on this slide. So we were able to offer 24 summer internships, um, which were supervised by our early career researchers. We had seven pre-doctoral fellowships um, and uh, we were awarded 16 uh, studentships and were able to leverage further studentships, um, either as jointly funded SPHR art PhD studentships or uh, leveraged by members um, from their institutions or from other funders. Um, and as you can see at the bottom of these lozenges, um, we now have people uh, graduating from these different parts of our, our program, which is just wonderful to see. And of course, importantly, we also had uh, 10 postdoctoral fellowships. And of course, it's important to just remember the context in which all this uh, was happening because this program kicked in partway through uh, QQ2. And so all of these things were um, hugely affected by the pandemic. And so we were 
uh, very grateful to the NIHR who, who provided um, additional uh, support uh, for those people who were particularly adversely affected uh, during that time. So this is just um, a, a list here of some of the achievements um, of our trainees, our PhD students and our fellows. And as you can see, just um, some fantastic uh, outputs here in terms of publications, presentations, blogs. Um, we encouraged our trainees to do placements and uh, as you can see, a goodly number of them managed to do that in spite of the challenges of having a placement uh, during a pandemic. Um, and uh, they've been able to, to leverage other funding awards, um, both from uh, the NIHR and from our ResNet funding, which I'll come on to in a minute. Um, ResNet has uh, continued with a very healthy uh, membership um, of over 130. And one of the things that um, our early career researchers in the first quinquennium told us was that it would be really nice for them to have some um, pump priming kind of money to enable them to get their uh, first chance to uh, have a PI grant. And so we um, developed uh, ResNet funding awards um, and we had seven of those um, during Quinquennium II, all of which have been fantastically uh, successful, not only giving people the opportunity for their first PI grant, but actually um, having teams of early career researchers working on this has been, I think, very rewarding for all involved um, and provided really important networking opportunities. Um, so that so those those have been a, a huge success and we'll hear a bit more about that um in a minute from 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 one of the recipients of those um the resnet uh has its own annual meeting um and this year it's going to be held on the first of september and there'll be more information about that circulated shortly um and resnet has its own uh, dedicated web page it's a mailing list um and has its own uh, committee um, with uh, chairs and uh, deputy chairs drawn from uh, the fellows and the PhD students um, and uh, very much a self-organising uh, thing which works incredibly well. Another important part of our capacity development programme has been training activity. Um, there's been a lot of effort gone into developing dedicated uh, training pages on our website um, with profiles for each of our trainees um, and project pages. Um, we've also uh, hosted um, a large number of events with lots of uh, attendees and have begun co-hosting events with our sister schools, uh, School for uh, Social Care and Primary Care Research. Um, and the first one of those, um, in, which was on improving diversity in research, was, was very successful. And there will be more of those to follow in QQ3, I'm sure. Um, as part of the ASM, we uh, ask all our students and fellows to provide presentations. Only We're only going to be able to show um, a very few of those this morning on the stage, but they are all available in the Expo, uh, Expo part of the uh, platform. So please do uh, go and enjoy those. Um, and finally, uh, we host regular um, networking events for um, our trainees. We have um, um, a weekly um, writing hub on Friday mornings, which people can join. Um, and we also have a bi-monthly meetup for our uh, ARC, joint ARC um, SPHR PhD students. Um, and it has to be said that our early career researchers are incredibly good at also organizing events themselves. Um, finally, just going to um, a, a new area of our work, which is de formally developing an alumni association. Um, as you can see, we've got we've just listed there on the left hand side some of the amazing successes of our uh, alumni, people who are graduating now. Um, we're delighted that um, as we've been contacting um, our alumni, 93% have said that they want to carry on working in public health research is just a fantastic outcome in terms of our uh, capacity development work. Uh, and they all want to stay in touch through our alumni association. And we're going to be having a celebration event um, in November for all um, of our uh, trainees and students who, who, are, who are graduating now. 
and we'll keep in touch with an alumni letter. And we're also uh, hoping to provide um, mentoring opportunities. So for our alumni to, to mentor the new intake of trainees and PhD students um, and provide networking opportunities. So that's been a very um, quick uh, summary of our research capacity development work over the 10 years. And I, I hope you can see from uh, what I've been able to show briefly this morning, how incredibly uh, successful it is and how delighted we are to see um, how well all of our students and trainees are doing. But it's now um, time to move on. And it's um, my absolute delight to introduce um, Professor Audrey Dillo, who is Dean of the NIHR Academy, um, as well as Professor of Endocrinology and Metabolism and an NIHR Senior Investigator. Uh, all of you may not be too sure of what the NIHR Academy does, but um, they provide all of the uh, academic research training programs within the NIHR. And as Dean, uh, therefore, Wolgit is responsible for oversight of all of that and for, for, for their development and delivery. Um, and we look forward um, very much to hearing more about that work now. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen um, and uh, hand over to you, Wolgit. Hello. You're live. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone. Um, uh, and I'm sorry I can't join you. I'm at the Academy of Medical Sciences at a faculty away day today, but it's a great pleasure to tell you a bit about me and the NHR Academy uh, and what our hopes are for the future. Uh, and, and I think the main mission that, that we're aiming to deliver is a vision to offer a quality of opportunity for career development for all healthcare professionals, including those in public health and social care research. So I'm uh, Walter Dillon, Professor of Endocrinology and Metabolism at Imperial, and took over as NHR, Dean of the NHR Academy in September last year from Dave Jones, who I'd been working with for a number of years. So I've had the pleasure of uh, three NHR fellowships, finishing up with an NHR research professorship, um, uh, and these have transformed my career, and I think fellowships um, can make a major impact by giving you protected research and training time um, to progress in your research career. I've also been involved in training for a, a number of years, both locally and then nationally, with the NHR Academy team and Dave Jones, and then um, uh, uh, also took over as head of division of diabetes and chronology at Imperial uh, about two or three years ago. Uh, and as I said, took over as Dean of the NHR Academy in September 2021. So I'm very passionate about um, uh, training the next generation of researchers um, and the NHR Academy, I think, is, is one way that we can um, hopefully help. So what do we do at the NHR Academy? Well, we are all about people. We want to train, uh, attract, train and support the people conducting leading edge research focused on needs of pub uh, patients and the public. Um, so we help coordinate research capacity development and um, your School of Public Health is, is one of those uh, capacity development organisations. But we also manage national competitions for training and career development awards. Um, and that's to the tune of about £120 million spend purely on our fellowships and competitions each year. So it's a huge amount of money investment in, in the next generation. So what about for you specifically as you move forward? Some of you are now coming to the end of your uh, research opportunities in in the school. So what, what have we got on offer? Well, actually, this is a busy slide, and I'm not going to go through it in great detail, but it is actually a really good slide because it shows you that um, all of the opportunities are available for all healthcare professionals from any background. And what we've tried to do here, as you can see in the columns at the top, is pre-doctoral, doctoral, early post-doctoral, and senior post-doctoral, and then chair. So um, anybody from any background uh, can apply for the things in green there at the top in the top row. And that's research schemes and fellowships that are available for all healthcare professionals from doctoral level all the way up to research professorship. Pre-doctoral level is mainly for uh, methodologists. 
if you're an allied health, if you're not a doctor or a dentist, you can apply for the ICA scheme. So this is for allied health professionals, and that's in red, similar number of schemes, similar schemes there. And they're also eligible for the fellowships in green. The, the ones in uh, orange are uh, pre and post doctoral opportunities for doctors and dentists. And then I wouldn't forget, and you can see there that the, the uh, schools are mentioned, the, the bit at the bottom, which is where uh, I guess many people are, uh, on this meeting are funded from, is um, um, all of the infrastructures that are, that are around up and down the country. So there's lots of capacity development um, within those structures as well. Uh, in addition to which, um, following research opportunities that you've had so far, that you hopefully will be able to move into um, um, the next phase of, uh, of your career if, if you're keen to do so. So what, are, what is the Academy doing looking forward? Uh, so our major strategic priorities um, are, as I, as I mentioned, a quality of opportunity for all healthcare professionals. Um, we're very uh, aware that nurses, midwives, allied health professionals, healthcare scientists, pharmacists and psychologists, and it comes up with an acronym of NMAPS, for want of a better acronym, but that's the best one we've come up with. Um, uh, public health and social care are obviously uh, very important as we move forward, uh, and really developing uh, early career opportunities all the way to research professors. Um, and the bit that's in small writing there is, 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 uh, is public, it's not a, a secret, um, it's in the public domain. So in the autumn budget of 2021, where there's difficulties in budgets up and down the country, actually the NHR budget for, uh, has been uh, flat for the next two years, but then for the third year, there's confirmed uplift in funding of 40 million in new investment in social care research, 30 million to support investment in research skills, uh, to level up opportunities for underrepresented groups, um, uh, especially for nurses, midwifery and allied health professionals. And then we've also got to focus on new medical schools and making sure there's research opportunities for those people coming through. Equality, diversity and inclusion um, is very high on the agenda, as it is for many organisations, and we're making good progress. We tried to look at this data about two years ago, and the data was very poor. And so we've mandated that for all NHR applications, this data needs to be now completed, and we've got the first set of data, which has given us a, a nice 100-page report that you can read there. But um, what's very useful about this data is that we've got real data and evidence that we can make changes on and see where we've got issues in terms of EDI. And just to give you one example, we noted that there was a low number of people from ethnic minority background on the fellowships panels, and we're actively doing something based on that evidence. Um, uh, and last slide, so what, what the other opportunities that we're thinking about is working with industry. We've had, uh, there's, I think there's a lot of opportunity to be able to translate your research quickly. Uh, and there's the Development Skills Enhancement Award, which is a one-year award if you want to um, uh, start working with industry uh, as well as uh, develop further uh, research opportunities. And we've got joint fellowships with Pfizer, and we're looking to expand that uh, as, as we move forward. The other thing that we think has, has gone very well is a uh, number of people coming through with doctorates, which is fantastic. But we now, 16 years since the uh, advent of NHR, need more postdoctoral opportunities so that there's jobs and opportunities for people to go to once they've done their PhD to continue their careers. So um, thanks very much for inviting me. Um, and um, we'll go to the first video. Who's going to be Nicola Merritt, from my understanding? Okay. Hi. Actually, it's me again, Walden. I just wanted to uh, say thank you uh, very much indeed for that helpful and uh, concise walk through your own research career journey and some of the key um, opportunities provided by the Academy um, and, and the plans for the future. It's been really great um, having you join us today. So, so thank you very much indeed. And. Uh, I'm now um, delighted to be able to introduce a series of presentations representing each component of our research capacity development programme. Um, and we're going to start um, with a recorded presentation uh, by Nicola Merritt, who was one of our 24 interns. Um, and she was supervised by um, one of our ResNet members, um, Rebecca Mead at Lilac. Um, and at the time, Nicola was doing an undergraduate uh, degree in sociology, but um, she has now been awarded an NIHR Three Schools Mental Health um, Program Master's Scholarship. So that's that's fantastic. So, so we're going to go into that video now. Hi, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me. 
My name is Nicola Merritt and in summer 2021 I participated in the School for Public Health Researchers summer internship programme which I have been asked to speak a little bit about today to you all. Namely the projects that I was part of, the skills and the opportunities that I have gained from my internship and how overall this has enhanced if not created my personal career in health research which I am very thankful of. So my project was part of the LILAC collaboration between Lancaster University and the University of Liverpool. I worked with my supervisor, Dr. Rebecca Mead and Professor Jenny Pepe, and we investigated whether the COVID-19 pandemic has contributed to the opening of a policy window for greater equity sensitive policy making at a local level. To explain this more, we developed a data extraction template to look at local authority reports for an equity sensitive approach to their policy making, such as if there was consideration of and solutions made around the wider social determinants of health, or by contrast, if reports demonstrated a lifestyle drift, the trend in policy making to place the responsibility of health onto an individual. Altogether, we conducted a documentary analysis of two data sets. Firstly, a report, 19 reports from one local authority area from before March 2020 and after March 2020. And then we looked at nine other local authority areas for their COVID-19 recovery strategies. Our research showed that equity featured more centrally in policy language post March 2020. However, lifestyle drift remained evident uh, throughout all moments. Therefore, in the areas we explored, COVID-19 pandemic was a positive opportunity for local government to place equity at the centre of policy making. Yet awareness is still needed to balance responsibility between the individual and the state. I would recommend this internship programme to so many people that I know due to the skills and the opportunities that you can take part in and learn and how that contributes to your future career in health research if you wanted to. So, for example, this project was actually the first ever project I took part in on conducting health research. And it's confirmed to me that I do want to become a lecturer and academic researcher in this field. One of the main reasons for this is because from the second I joined the School for Public Health Research and the LILAC collaboration, I've been shown that health research can be so rewarding. Whilst it is complicated at times, what we do is for a reason, and that is to make this society a better and healthier place and I'm very excited to be part of that movement. Secondly, this internship programme has allowed me to learn many new skills which I have applied to my own undergraduate degree in sociology. Um, I have learned research software, we used Envivo to do our own project and I've used this now in my sociology degree. I also took part in an advisory group meeting to work on my public speaking and communicating projects to others, which I'm developing right now as well. And I also created my first ever research briefing, which you can see on the right hand side of this slide, though you can't read it um, with that font, so don't worry. Finally, I'm very happy to announce that the work that we did for our project will now contribute to a large of 2022 publication by my supervisor, Dr. Rebecca Mead, which is funded by the Research Network Fund. So it's really exciting to see what we did uh, be published and out there in society. Admittedly, though, what I am most excited about is the next step of my own career. After completing the internship last summer, I was informed by the School for Public Health Research of a scholarship being offered by NIHR for six students to complete a master's course with a focus on mental health for an underserved population in society. With the support and encouragement of this school and my supervisor, I applied for this scholarship and I have been awarded it. This September, I will be studying at University College London, working with the School for Primary Care Research to investigate pelvic pain and the relationship it has to mental health and how our primary care services can better respond to these needs for women. I know for a fact, if it wasn't for this internship too, I would never have developed the confidence and the skills to have applied for a scholarship as big as this. And for that, I am inter internally grateful for this school. 
And with that, thank you for listening to my little presentation and also to be welcome today to speak to you all at the annual scientific meeting. I am truly honoured and thankful to all the organisers of this event. Okay, well, that was a lovely uh, video there from uh, Nicola. And uh, I, I hope Nicola is actually in the audience with us. So please do use uh, the comments uh, slash chat function uh, for any questions that you that you have for her. Um, but we're going to move on now to um, a live presentation. And I'm delighted to introduce two of our pre-doctoral fellows, Emma Adams from FUSE and Chiara Rinaldi from the London School of Hygiene and tropical medicine. Um, and again, encourage you please to post questions in, in the chat for Emma and Chara. Um, but over to you guys now for your, for your presentation. Can you all see my slides? Yeah, we can. Okay. Um, Hi everyone, my name is uh, Chiara and uh, together with Emma I will tell you a bit about our experience of the Pre-Doc Fellowship, uh, starting with why we uh, decided to apply for the Fellowship. So um, both of us previously hadn't been working in the UK or in sort of research universities and after graduating from my master's degree I actually took up a job in a mental health hospital in Ontario, Canada. And originally I worked on sort of forensic mental health research and evaluating word level initiatives, but eventually I moved to working on population level mental health and substance use work. Um, and in that work, I worked with marginalized and underrepresented populations such as our indigenous communities and also people experiencing homelessness. And it was in the role that I found out about the pre-doctoral fellowship scheme um, and took a leap of faith and thought I'd move across across the ocean to be able to work on mental health research in an area with one of the greatest needs. Uh, I did my uh, master's a bit closer to the UK, so in the Netherlands. Uh, and after my master's, I uh, did some consultancy projects for local government. Uh, and then I also worked as a research assistant in um, or, uh, initiatives that would uh, promote collaboration between governments and, and the private sector and third sector organizations. Uh, so then when I decided I wanted to do a, a PhD and I found out about this uh, opportunity to do a pre-doctoral fellowship uh, and decided to apply and get some more experience uh, before doing a PhD. So we thought it would be useful to maybe talk about our top three memories from our fellowship. And I think we can all realize the last two years has been a bit of a challenge for most. Um, if you mind moving to the next slide, Kiara. Um, I wanted to start off with sort of my big memory from my fellowship. And I was lucky, and, and Rona mentioned earlier, about the ResNet funding opportunities. And so I was awarded one of those. Um, so I had the opportunity to co-produce a qualitative study around access to mental health and substance use for people experiencing homelessness during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and this photo you see on the left is, is for me my favorite thing from that project in that like, I think it was a lot of firsts and a lot of ways to learn new things. And I had the opportunity to work with a community partner, Tyne Housing, um, and turns out they have a community farm in Newcastle and, and they let me go walk some goats when I went and did some data collection and was looking for a bit of a break. And I think that really highlights just some of the unexpected adventures you can have in the fellowship. The photo in the middle, I think, is one that's near and dear to both myself and Kiara's heart. And it's it's from a writing retreat that we did together with all the pre-doctoral fellows, fellows. And I think what's really great is we had a cohort of six amazing women that we worked with um, and had the chance to work with each other and help each other along the road and, and, and just help us get through the last two years. Yeah, I think this was uh, particularly nice because it was the first uh, in-person event that we all attended uh, because of the pandemic. Obviously, we didn't have much opportunity to see uh, each other face to face, but this was just very nice. Um, then uh, the third picture I took while I was doing uh, some data collection for my placement. So as part of the fellowship, I did a practice placement at the London Borough of Haringey, and my project was about um, online uh, grocery delivery and online food delivery services. And on the right, this is a picture I took of a bus advertising alcohol um, for one of the 
online grocery delivery apps in uh, London. So I thought I included as uh, just to talk a bit about uh, the placement I did, which uh, I enjoyed a lot. Then uh, what are the top impacts from uh, our fellowship? Um, so together uh, we have uh, contributed to uh, just under 15 peer reviewed and other publications and some of them are also still under review. And for funding between the two of us, we've had over 1 million pounds in funding since the start of our fellowships. And that's through additional fellowships, project specific funding and also career development awards. Uh, we also developed uh, lots of new skills, so presentation skills, uh, particular research skills, for example, in evidence synthesis, uh, project management skills, uh, and many more. And I guess sort of the final thing, which, you know, seems really part and parcel with the School for Public Health, is we had the opportunity to really network and develop this peer support group. Um, and, and that was sort of within our cohort of pre-doctoral fellows through Zoom dates and um, our in-person writing retreat, but also within the wider School for Public Health research through things like the ResNet network meeting, things like this ASM. Um, but also what's really great with the School for Public Health is that we were able to identify mentors external to our institution to sort of grow our networks outside of the areas we're from. Um, I was based in the Northeast and Kiara was based in London and we had the opportunity to meet researchers across England and, and learn from them as well. So I think we've, we've learned a lot of things and it's kind of nice to know what, what we're doing now and, and what it's led to us doing. Um, and I think, you know, just at a very high level where we are going now. Yeah, so I have uh, been awarded an NIHR doctoral fellowship um, to do a PhD and I started that uh, this January. Uh, and this PhD is about uh, the tensions in local government between uh, one hand high street revitalization and economic growth and the other hand uh, prioritizing public health objectives. And for me, um, I was uh, awarded a mental health research fellowship within the Applied Research Collaboration for the Northeast North Cumbria. And so I moved into that once my pre-doctoral fellowship end, ended. And it's given me the opportunity to just work on some of the publications, work on some other ideas I have and, and work on some projects. And I've also been awarded a career development award through the NIHR three school mental health program, which is allowing me to really have the chance to develop skills around evidence synthesis. And I'm doing this through co-producing a systematic review around trauma during homelessness. So um, we know that was pretty quick, but we thought, we didn't want to bore anyone with too many details. And um, so we're here to sort of chat to you now and, and we're open to questions, but you can also get in touch at any point in time, um, either by email or Twitter. So thanks for listening. Okay, thank you so much, um, Emma and uh, Kiara for that uh, fabulous presentation and it's just, uh, delightful to hear all the amazing things that you managed to to cram into the to the two years that you that you were with us as, as pre doctoral fellows. Some uh, lovely comments coming in. Um, I hope you can see uh, about your about your presentations. Um, I don't see any questions yet, but uh, can you see the comments? <laughs> Yeah, lots of people really, really, really uh, appreciative um, of your work. Perhaps um, maybe one, one you'd like to say a little bit more about what you think your longer term career ambitions are, going to, uh, are in terms of being public health researchers. Where would you like to see yourselves eventually? Do you want um, to go first, Kiara? Yes, uh, so I'm currently uh, doing a PhD, but uh, after that, I would like to apply for an NHR uh, advanced fellowship and continue my research in public health. Great. And I think for me, I think similarly, eventually going down, getting a PhD and continuing on the fellowship path, I think we can both admit this has been a really nice opportunity to be independent and have that chance to be independent researchers. And we think sort of fellowships are the best way to do that. Great. Okay, I'm just checking to see if there's any any more questions. And what what advice would you um, would you give to to Pete to to folk in your at your sort of stage in, in in the career? What would be your number one bit of bit of advice? <laughs> I guess for for me, it might be you know 
figure out what you're most passionate about and find a way to do that. I think, especially during COVID, it was hard to motivate yourself to do things. And if you can find something that you love, that's probably the easiest way to make sure you'll keep going even when times get tough. Great. And there's a question from Ashley here. Um, do either of you have examples of uh, of when things have not always gone to plan? <laughs> Uh, well, I think um, just at, at the beginning, obviously, we went into lockdown. Uh, I think that whole experience for both of us was just a bit harder. And uh, some of the conferences we were supposed to go to were moved online. Uh, some of the projects were delayed. So I think just in general, doing a pre-doctoral fellowship in a pandemic uh, meant a lot of things didn't go to plan. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yes. I think a pandemic's got to got to count as the as the as, as definitely things not going to plan for sure. Great. Okay. Well, I think we've probably just come to to, to the end of the time um, with you guys. But thank you so much indeed um, for all the amazing work that you've do, you've done, um, and we wish you every success um, with, with 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 what's what with what's to come. So thanks both very much, and we hope you enjoy the rest of the of the day with us. Thanks, Rona. Thank you. So we're, we're going to move on now to our next presentation. And I'm delighted to uh, introduce Rosie Jenkins, um, who uh, is from Imperial College in London, but now working um, as a public health officer uh, for Birmingham City Council. Um, and Rosie's PhD um, was about uh, impacts of the changes to public sector spending on nutritional intakes and health outcomes in the UK. Um, and, and she's gonna be telling us more about that now. Um, but again, please post questions for, for Rosie in the chat. So lovely to see you, Rosie, over to you. Hi, hi, Rona. Hi, everyone. It's so great to be here. And it's particularly great to be <clears throat> representing the fantastic SPHR2 PhD co cohort. Um, I hope that I do the cohort justice um, because they're a fantastic bunch and there's been so many amazing outcomes from that already. Um, so in terms of this talk, I guess I'll be going from a bit of a different angle um, about how the capacity building and training during my PhD was useful as I moved into public health practice after my PhD. Um, I don't have any slides, but um, to, just to give you a bit of a rundown, I'll be talking about the context of how I decided to do a PhD, um, a bit about my PhD and my findings, and then kind of spend most of the time on things that I learned in my PhD and what I've been up to since, particularly through the lens of kind of moving into public health practice after a public health PhD. Um, so just in terms of context, um, since I did my master's in public health um, a while ago now, in, in 2015, I've known that I wanted to do public health practice, um, specifically um, go on to the public health speciality training at some point. And so I assumed that a PhD wasn't for me because I didn't want to work in research. Um, but due to a kind of series of, of events, um, I ended up as a research assistant at Imperial College after my master's. And over that time, I became increasingly convinced that actually doing a PhD would be a really valuable step um, for my PhD career, despite um, not actually wanting to be a career researcher. And I sought the wisdom um, of a number of people. And one thing I particularly remember is Professor Helen Ward. Um, I don't know if she's, if she's here today, but if you are Helen, sorry, but just name dropping you. <laughs> um, but she said to me that I, don't need, I didn't need to do a public health PhD to become a public health consultant but doing a public health PhD would make me a better public health consultant. Now, I'm not a public health consultant yet, but I hope that um, from this talk, you'll see that, that, that the latter is true, that um, doing a public health PhD has made me a better public health practitioner. And so around the time that these thoughts had crystallized, um, I saw the collection of SPHR2 PhDs advertised, um, and I applied and was accepted for the PhD that you mentioned there on um, the impact of the UK's, um, UK government's austerity policies on diets and health. And I was supervised by a fab team at Imperial, um, uh, Dr. Anthony Laverty, Dr. Esther Vamos, um, in the Public Health Policy Evaluation Unit run by Professor Chris Millett, um, and also by Professor David Taylor Robinson at the University of Liverpool. So just to talk you through a bit about my PhD and what I found and what I did. Um, so in my PhD, I examined the impact of UK austerity policies on food intakes, food insecurity, and nutritional anemia hospital admissions. And I did this by undertaking two systematic reviews and two quantitative pieces of work. So firstly, I systematically reviewed the impacts of the Great Recession, which is the 2008 recession, 
on austerity policies, um, of austerity policies on food intakes. And I found that the Great Recession was associated with diverse impacts on food intakes, um, including a decrease in calories in high income countries and an increase in calories in middle income countries. And this decrease in high income countries may have been due to a decrease in fast food, sugary products and, veg um, and soft drink consumption, which obviously might um, convey positive benefits for health. But I also found um, decreases in fruit and vegetable consumption. So overall, it suggested potential mixed impacts. I um, also um, looked at studies um, on the impact of austerity policies on food intakes, and there were only two, and neither were based in the UK, which highlighted the need for research um, of the impact of UK austerity policies on food intakes. Secondly, I systematically reviewed the relationship between austerity policies and food insecurity and food bank use. And I found that austerity policies, particularly welfare reform, were unanimously associated with increased food insecurity and food bank use. Um, and then in terms of my quantitative work, um, I then examined the impacts of changes to local authority service spending on food purchasing using linear fixed, fix, fixed effects regression. And I found that reductions in local authority service spending were associated with small mixed impacts on fruit and, vegetable, fruit and vegetables, foods high in fat, salt and sugar and takeaway purchases. And I found that decreases in total local authority expenditure were associated with decreased um, purchasing of foods high in fat, salt and sugar, which was contrary to what we expected, but also decreased fruit and vegetable consumption and greater takeaway consumption. Uh, and in my final piece of work, I investigated the impacts of changes to local authority service spending on nutritional anemia hospital admissions using fixed effects and Poisson regression. And I found that reductions in local authority spending due to austerity policies may have led to increases in nutritional anemia hospital admissions. And the results throughout my whole PhD suggested that there were greater impacts on people of lower socioeconomic position. So that's what I did in my PhD. Um, and now just to take you through um, some things that I learned while I did that and what I've been up to since. So the week that I handed in my thesis, um, I started a job as the public health officer in the food system team at Birmingham City Council public, in the public health division. This was a brand new team that was initiated at a time when many other authorities were actually disbanding their food related functions. Um, and it was a, it's a small team of just four people. And of those, I'm the only one with research experience um, and only one of just a handful in the whole division who have a PhD. And through this role, I've seen firsthand how valuable a PhD can be in public health practice. So I'll now talk through some of the skills that I learned during my PhD and how they helped me in public health practice. So firstly, um, I gained skills in systematic reviewing and meta-analysis. So being able to review evidence to summarise it and make recommendations is a really vital skill in public health practice and something I, ho I honed by undertaking two systematic reviews. Um, I also gained skills in statistical analysis, um, specifically fixed effects models and Poisson models, but also deciding what, which models to use and what methods to use um, gave me an understanding and overview of a lot of different methods that can be used in public health. And this understanding um, of those methods was, has been really useful. Although my role is pretty strategic and I'm not doing data analysis day to day, actually we're doing quite a lot of commissioning of projects. And so um, actually, an understanding of methods when you're designing research for others to do is really, really important. Um, I've also had a lot of experience in communicating during my PhD. Um, so I, I won first place in the presentation competition at the Imperial School for Public Health PhD Symposium. And I was also runner up in the SBHR PhD student three minute thesis competition as voted for by the Public Partners Network. And I've also presented my PhD work at four conferences two Greater London Authority meetings and two, I guess now three, um, SPHR ASMs. And so the ability to present complex research and adapt my style based on who I'm presenting to has been a really useful skill that I've learned during my PhD. My current job requires communications with a range of stakeholders, people who use food banks, people who are running food banks, people running restaurants, researchers, members of the public, and the ability to adapt my communication style to different groups and convey the importance of the work I'm doing and how I'm doing it has been important. I've also um, developed an understanding of food systems and made lots of research contacts and know about the available resources in that area. And that's been particularly useful um, in writing the Birmingham Food System Strategy, which I'll talk about in a moment um, that I've been doing in this role. 
that's been helpful both for writing the strategy itself um, and also having a good knowledge of the context as I was particularly um, involved in the writing of the context section. And I actually used quite a lot of the data and resources and tools developed by other people um, in the SBHR. For example, I used um, the FEAT tool that's been developed by the University of Cambridge researchers. Um, I also honed an ability to write well, concisely and quickly um, through writing my thesis. And that was really useful as I'm often working on reports and things like that under pressure. And I think in some ways that's one of the most valuable skills as I've realized I can write quick and well compared to others. Um, and my PhD supervisors will definitely tell you that I was not very quick or particularly good at writing um, before um, at the beginning of my PhD. So that is a real skill that I've learned. I was also involved in the SPHR um, PPIE implementation group and understanding patient and public involvement and engagement better has been really useful given the emphasis on citizens and what's important to them and co-production in um, the local authority. It's really helpful to have that foundation. I also grew more passionate about public health in my PhD, which I think is a really underrated outcome, but actually a really important one um, as part of a career in public health, whether that's in research or practice. And also in seeing throughout my PhD, just how much bigger an impact there was on people of lower socioeconomic position. That's developed a real passion for mitigating inequalities, which I also think is so important in public health practice. I also grew in confidence about myself and my abilities, which is, of course, really useful. I have great, gained a greater understanding of the political environment in which public health and local authorities operate in. So I wasn't surprised going into that environment. I've also developed um, better time management and a work ethic that's helpful, particularly doing a PhD alone in my living room um, for half of it. And finally, I've published three papers, nearly four, and um, just even having the title of doctor sets you apart in that environment. So even that alone has been really valuable. And then just really quickly, what I've been up to since. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, we've written the Birmingham Food System Strategy. I'm an author on that document. Um, and that included looking at the context and also working on the nine different work streams, such as food sourcing, food transformation, food economy, food skills and knowledge. I've also commissioned um, research and other projects, for example, the development of tools for youth so that they can look at the food environment in their schools themselves and make change for it. And also um, looking at eating guides that develop um, culture, that, sorry, developing eating guides that celebrate culture. I've also been looking at food justice um, and that feels particularly important for me as um, some of my PhD was on food bank use and food insecurity. Um, and that's include reviewing um, stigma and shame in people who use food banks and how to prevent that. And also teaching students research methods for them to be able to do a project in food banks. And then finally, I've been working on the, the Commonwealth project as the Commonwealth Games legacy in Birmingham, which has had nothing to do with my PhD. Um, it's involved collecting recipes, even doing some cooking videos, running a campaign on social media. But actually, it's used a lot of the soft skills that I developed in my PhD, like time management and kind of being able to look at lots of different things at the same time. So just to conclude, um, I've really enjoyed being in public health practice. It feels like I'm at the coal face of things that I was looking at during my PhD. But I hope that this has demonstrated that the capacity building and training that I enjoy during my SPHR PhD has been so helpful in developing me in that role. Um, I'm really happy to answer questions and I'll also put my email and my Twitter in the chat um, in case you want to get in contact with me. Thanks. Thank you so much indeed, Rosie. Um, I think you've more than done justice um, to uh, representing the cohort of SPHR PhD students. You're an amazing um, advocate for doing a, PhD, a public health research PhD and the value of that um, to public health practice. So thank you so much for that. And I will definitely um, be giving some thought to how we measure a passion in public health <laughs> as, as an outcome. I'm very taken by, by the idea of that. And we'll, we'll, we'll certainly see what we what we can do to make sure we're, we're capturing that going forward, because I think that's, as you say, that's that's really, really important. Um, I'm So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely think about how we measure enthusiasm for that. Great. So I think we've got lots of um, questions in, in, in the chat for you. Um, Monique uh, wanted to know, um, would you have any advice to anyone who thinks a PhD, PhD research isn't for them, but who are passionate about the topic? 
Yeah, well, in some ways, you're you're almost all of the way there if you're passionate about a topic. I think that was one of the things I was most careful about in choosing a PhD was I knew that it was in for the long haul. I think, um, as I said, I kind of got wisdom from as many people as possible. And that kind of a PhD is a is a marathon, not a sprint. And therefore, don't don't do one just for the sake of it, but do it because you are passionate about the thing that you're looking at. Um, I think that's really important. And actually being passionate about a topic is probably the, a really good reason to do a PhD. And so I would I would suggest kind of focusing on that, but then getting getting wisdom and advice for, for people more senior like I did. Um, that was a really key factor in me deciding to, um, to, to do a PhD. Great. Lots of lovely comments coming in for you. Um, Payman Ayedab asks, um, how do you see your experience of research helping with the work of the council more broadly in public health? Oh, that's, that's a really good question. Um, I guess at the moment, mostly just focused on public health, but but actually there's lots of ways in which if you're someone who's learned research and, and learned how to do different things, then there's a real role in, in teaching others how to do that. And I, I mentioned it at the end, but we recently did um, a project of kind of capacity building for students where we taught them, it was actually a qualitative method that I taught them, um, which is participant observation. And then they went out into community cafes and um, and kind of did some research in there. And um, while that was in the public public um, health division, actually we're kind of looking at whether we can make that a model for things more widely in the council because there's a there's real value in um, in that that kind of thing in all sorts of services and areas. Um, and so I think a lot of the the area of beyond public health is in is in that training and capacity building. Um, but also things like being evidence-based, being able to look at evidence and and make recommendations from it. The things that are bread and butter in public health aren't often quite so much in some other areas of the council, Um, not to be too too rude to my colleagues. Um, So I think, yeah, that's that's something that's, I think, really, really valuable and something we can try and get out into into, um, other aspects of the local authority. Great. Okay, we've got, I think, more questions, Rosie, than we can probably uh, address to you um, at now. Uh, maybe just take take one more um, from, from Emma. How have you been using your research experience in terms of indicating research and practice in the local authority more widely? Maybe you've already answered that, actually, I think, in what, in what, in, in what, in what you've said. Um, and there's one from Joanna McLaughlin here. Um, about asking, do you plan to be directly involved in research in the future? And and how will you combine that with um, a full-time service role? So I think it's a question about maybe some advice on how do you manage to, to do both of those things when you're mm. in, a, in, in a practice role? Yeah, I think, well, to, to answer also Emma's question in that, I think mm. there's a real, having been in both, you realise how siloed they are. And I think like at Birmingham, we have loads of research um, and loads of findings and data that I would never have found during my PhD. And I worked quite hard to find useful data. So I think there is something there in terms of bringing, bringing those two things together. Um, and we're, we're trying quite hard to do that with the Mandala Consortium who are doing a big food systems related project in Birmingham. So, so working on integrating research and practice, but recognize that that's not something that one person can do. It, it requires um, whole system change. Um, I, yeah, it's <laughs> to answer Joanna's question. Um, I think I've, ne- I don't think I've ever been as busy as I am now. Um, so that's without doing any kind of research on the side. So I think that's definitely going to take some, some thought from me in terms of how to do that. I'm keen to, um, be involved in that. I'm also very keen to be a practice partner um, in SBHR research. If anyone has any food, food system stuff going on, feel free to contact me. But um, I think I can hopefully add some value there in terms of what's going on in practice. Um, But it's certainly something I need to think about maybe when the food strategy consultation is done um, as to how I can um, how I can better integrate those things. But I am certainly keen in in kind of keeping keeping a finger in the the research world as well. Yeah, lovely. Okay, Rosie, well, thank you so much um, for for your for your lovely presentation and how refreshing not to have uh, slides for a change. So moving on now in the programme, um, I'm delighted to introduce um, Dr. Neve McMahon from uh, Lilac, um, who, is, who is now an alumni. Um, she was actually initially awarded um, funding through uh, Clark Northwest Cumbria, which is now an ARC. Um, and uh, she also took on NIHR opportunities 
um, such as the doctoral training camp and the Spark Award, but I'm sure she's going to say more about that now um, and, uh, and, and what she's doing um, at the moment. So lovely to see you, Neve, um, and over to you. Thanks, Rona, and what brilliant presentations from the morning. It's just been um, amazing to hear about all the work that's going on. Um, so I'm going to speak very briefly about my experience of um, doing a postdoctoral launching fellowship and transitioning to a Wellcome Trust Research Fellowship. So I've bought into the cheese here with my lifting off. Um, I'm based at Lancaster University in the Liverpool and Lancaster University's Collaboration for Public Health. So I thought it would make sense just to give you a little bit of context um, for what I did for my PhD research. So as Rona says, I was in um, Clark Northwest Coast doing a PhD studentship. And I actually had a really blank canvas when I was starting. So my only brief really for the studentship was to contribute to the ARC's over or the Clark's overarching ambition to reduce health inequalities in the Northwest. And so at the outset of that um, collaboration, we had a lot of workshops and discussions, prioritization, setting exercises. And what I was noticing at that time was quite a bit of talking at cross purposes between our different partners. So we had academics, we had people from NHS, from local government, third sector organizations, um, patients and members of the public. And so it was really difficult, I think, to get going with um, getting a clear sense of what did we mean by health inequalities? What counted as a health inequality? But then also what was interesting me even more, because I was reading the health inequalities literature and trying to bring myself up to speed on the key theories, frameworks, concepts that we are using to get a sense of what the problem is and what we need to do is that there was a disconnect between how I saw some of these concepts and metaphors being used in the academic literature and then how they were translating in practice and how they were being picked up and understood. So I ended up looking specifically at one example, which is with the upstream downstream story or analogy. And so I know I'm in a room full of public health people, so I don't need to explain this one, but just the very simple idea that um, we invest a lot of time, energy, resources, money, um, engaging in heroic rescue efforts, tackling the symptoms of the problem. And we seem to be constantly battling with this idea of how we could get upstream and get at the root causes. So I'll tell you a little bit more about my PhD papers if you're interested in find out, finding out about the research finding themselves. But just a couple of takeaways for me, which really informed my um, next steps. This really sparked my interest in just the role of figurative language and story and metaphor and how we explain complex problems because health inequalities or a lot of the social problems we're facing are not very tangible sometimes. And so we're very dependent on metaphor and analogy to try and help people to get to grips with what we mean. But because of that, it's quite interesting to see how metaphors, how we can become quite dependent on them. And then over time within disciplines, they can actually evolve into technical terms. So you see people talking about upstream policies, which is absolutely fine. But originally upstream is a metaphor of prevention. And so the consequence then is that when we're bringing other people into the conversation, which is bread and butter public health, is that those metaphors are really and our concepts are open to interpretation in a range of different ways for a range of different audiences. So my experience with the Clark, it kind of felt like anybody I spoke to would say, oh, yes, well, we're working upstream to tackle health inequalities because of X, Y and Z. It was very relative to what people felt the problem of health inequalities were. So that was where I started. And at, by the end of my PhD, I was just very relieved to get the thesis in. And I was not in a position at all to think about writing a fellowship proposal. And so that was so brilliant when the postdoctoral launching fellowships were advertised, because in contrast to um, maybe an early career fellowship where you have to have a fully worked up proposal for the launching fellowships. It's about convincing the panel that if you had a bit of time that you could be competitive down the line. Um, and I just wanted to, for the benefit of anybody in the room who's maybe thinking about applying for some sort of bridging funding, you don't have to have it all sorted before you get started. So for me, there was a lot that I didn't have. At the time of my application, I didn't have any PhD publications and I really didn't have a clear fellowship plan. But with the nature of the beast in academia, you do need to get quite good at tooting your own horn in this game, and especially when you are applying for competitive funding applications. So there was a lot of things that I did have. I had extensive research experience. So prior to my PhD, I'd worked for three years in a stroke um, rehabilitation research team. That meant I had quite a few non-PhD related and non-public health outputs, um, but still demonstrated my um, research experience and my writing um, capacity. I also had other outputs, so I was always trying to, um, I, was, I want to be SPHR girl for a long time, trying to link in with different um, members and especially Fuse, trying to write blog posts uh, and get involved. While I didn't have a plan, I did have a clear sense of direction and I think I was able to sell that that was 
um, novel and timely um, and had a nice balance between, you know, maybe being um, theoretical, but also people could see the um, application of the insights that would come from this research down the line. I'd had um, some personal funding awards, so I think we've already had um, the Spark Award mentioned. Definitely worth looking at if you have capacity to do one of these short placements awards. And they're no longer just for people who are within an academic institution. If you're in local government, you can apply for a small pot of money to do a placement or to spend some time in a different part of the NIHR infrastructure. And so I, again, did my placement with Fuse with Professor Claire Bamber at Newcastle. And we had a co-authored publication off the back of that short placement. So again, just really giving you things to um, put some meat on the bones of your application when you are trying to convince people of um, where you're going with your research. Um, I had really good supervisors who just stuck my name in the hat for everything. So in the Northwest, we have the Northwest Coast Research and Innovation Awards. And one year I was um, got the Research Student of the Year. Again, just a nice um, esteem indicator to say that people recognize what you're up to. And as Rosie mentioned, I also did the three minute thesis competition and progressed through the UCLan heat. So it's just nice to be able to say that if you're claiming to be a good communicator, that you have some examples that can back it up. In terms of how I spent my fellowship, um, if anybody's done any training around fellowships, especially from the NIHR, you will be told about the golden triangle of person, place and project. So this is what I really focus my time on in terms of me as a person. I, am, I worked mostly on my PhD publications to try and get them out. Building a bit of an online profile, I'm not big into social media or Twitter, but I did start a personal blog where I was able to put lay summaries of my PhD papers. I did some training, especially around grant writing um, and also new methodologies for extending my research like uh, computer assisted methods for analyzing language or corpus linguistics and trying to just continuously build my own networks and collaborations, but within the, within the SPHR and beyond. So my PhD papers, um, I've got one in the Journal of Public Health, which is my analysis of how the upstream downstream metaphor is used to argue for specific forms of action within the academic literature, how the metaphor is then interpreted by different partners of an applied research collaboration and the disconnect between those. And I was also able to repurpose my lit review actually for the thesis. So um, qualitative research, looking at what explained health system actors thinking and action around social inequalities in health. In terms of the project, I can't say I have any um, top tips for writing a fellowship application. You just have to get something down and then um, depend on really constructive feedback from anybody you can get it from. So I have brilliant mentors. Susan and Andy are really supportive in getting an SPHR ideas incubator off the ground for some of the fellows where we got really helpful input on our early ideas. I was able to do a placement to kind of sense check what I was thinking and how that might apply to people who might use these ideas down the line. And very generous colleagues who give me a lot of time in this redrafting process. In terms of the place, luckily for me, Lancaster is just the perfect place for me to do a fellowship. Throughout my postdoctoral launching fellowship, I was very um, ably guided by Professor Jenny Pope, who kept me on track in getting all of these things right. But we also, having the SPHR at Lancaster, but also we've got a fantastic linguist, linguistics and English, Eng I can never say that, which is ironic, linguistics and English language department at Lancaster and Professor Ellen Esmino, who's an expert in framing and metaphor studies, is um, going to be a mentor on my study. So that was the goal is just to try and get all of these right, be the right person, doing the right project in the right place and make it very difficult for them to say no. It's so rewarding when you do eventually get these forms submitted. I went for a research fellowship in humanities and social science um, for the Wellcome Trust. That scheme has since changed. So this is closed and there's a different iteration of the schemes. But my title was Framing Inequalities Through Causal Stories, a Cross-Case Comparison and Critical Reflection. And I'll just very briefly tell you what I pitched to Wellcome. Um, I've just started in May. I was basically saying framing isn't um, such a new idea now, but if you want to do anything about a problem, you have to put some shape in it. You have to frame it. That's usually in the form of a causal story. So that causal story does a few things suggests causes, points to blame, ident identify some solutions and also some either mor moral, ethical or financial justification for why we need to do something about it. I was saying when it comes to health inequalities, that problem tends to be framed through a particular or predominant causal story, which is underpinned by logics from epidemiology. So, and metaphors of causal chains, linear causal chains, um, kind of polarized ways of thinking about upstream and downstream determinants, behavioral structural factors, and it's achieved a lot in raising awareness of the problem and getting us to think about these wider social factors. But I think it's still quite difficult for people to put into practice. And there's some critiques emerging around some of the our dominant ways of thinking about health inequalities that it can actually reinforce reductionist thinking. So we think about individual social determinants 
rather than really getting a better understanding of the social and political processes which are driving those. It can be overly deterministic and stigmatizing. Again, in our efforts not to victim blame, we can go the other um, side of the spectrum. And within the public and sometimes professional groups, it doesn't really challenge fatalistic perspectives that this is just too big a, big a problem that we can't do anything about. So I was saying, well, this is our health inequality stories. If we subscribe to the idea that health inequalities are one symptom or one manifestation of underlying social and economic inequality, well, then we, we're not alone in trying to frame this problem in a way that would enable us to tackle the wider social forces sustaining these different inequalities. So I said, maybe if we look at different sectors, I've suggested early years education, new justice, housing, and see what kind of ideas they use to um, frame inequalities and again, with a view towards action. It's a three-year study, um, in theory, straightforward work packages, framing analysis of the academic literature in terms of the causal stories used, how they translate into policy and practice, and then bringing everybody together to critically reflect on the tools that we have available to us to try and make sense of these very complex problems and how we might translate that into practice. So I'll leave it there. Just so many thank yous, um, Jenny, for the support in the launching fellowship itself. My fellowship mentors, um, Jenny Pope, Catherine Smith and Eleanor Semino. I've got a collaborators group and public advisors just getting off the ground now. And of course, Susan and Andy and the wider SPHR community. So that's me. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much uh, for, for that lovely presentation. Uh, Neve and uh, what you're about to do in terms of your welcome fellowship sounds absolutely fascinating and I hope maybe you'll have the opportunity to come back and tell us uh, more about what, about what you find it's obviously incredibly uh, pertinent to what to what we do in public health um, and some lovely lovely comments coming in about your your, your presentation um, and congratulating you on your on your fellowship um, in terms of a question, Eve, I wonder if you could just maybe say a little bit more about your placement. You mentioned that you've got a publication out of it, but it's something that we really encourage um, our trainees to, to try and do. So maybe just say a little bit how you organise that um, and, and, what, and what were the benefits of, of doing that? Um, yeah, so for this, oh, this Barack Award was the one where I got the publication from, and that was with Claire. So I didn't um, know Claire Bumper at the time. I just sent her a cold email saying, please, can I come and work with you? Um, and we just found some common ground. I think... The top tip for a placement if you for in terms of the spark is you need to find something that you're both interested in i don't think you can say i'd love to do a placement on this can you support me if you go in quite open-minded and see is there anything that you're trying to get off the ground but you just need a, another pair of hands um that's one route to go down and then in terms of the placement that i did as part of my launching fellowship that was um kind of came around in an organic way as such um jenny was involved with the lancashire and cumbria health equity commission that was going on here um, and there was an opportunity then, there was a lot of workshops going on with the different sectors actually, to try and tease out what the main barriers were, what the recommendations needed to be coming out of that. So I just kind of volunteered my note-taking abilities and slipped in to see what I could offer. But it was a, a brilliant experience for me because I just wanted to be a fly on the wall of conversations. That's all I ever want to be. So I was able to sit in rooms with, again, much more strategic people, very senior people in Lancashire and Cumbria who, I have a massive mandate to do something about health inequalities, but we're all just trying to figure it out and think about how we can how we can articulate it in a way that yeah brings people on board and you know clarifies the blueprint for action. I think we can, it's a funny thing about causal stories. I think we are up to speed in some ways about the causes. It's then translating that into convincing people exactly what we need to do and making that happen. So great, indeed. <laughs> Okay, um, so I think if there are more questions for, for Neve, please post them in the chat and Neve will be able to, to answer them in the chat um, afterwards. But thank you so much, Neve, and really, really well, well done. Um, and uh, yeah, as I say, let's hope we see you again soon. Okay, so um, the final presentation um, in this part um, of the morning is from um, one of our ResNet um, research awardees, um, Emily Widnall, um, who's at the University of Bristol, um, and um, she will introduce her, her, her topic um, and, and, and tell you more about what, what she did. Okay, over to you, Emily. Thanks, Rona. Okay. Hopefully you can see my screen. Please stop me if you can't. Um, so, yeah, my name's Emily Wednell. I'm a ResNet awardee from the University of Bristol, and I'm just going to be talking through my experiences of the funding, a little bit about my findings, and hopefully some advice. Um, so, 
really, why did I apply? There were several reasons. Um, one was to give myself an opportunity to, to develop and lead a small scale research project. Um, it was also a really good chance to enhance my independent researcher skills uh, and also expand my research in a key area of interest, which for me is um, adolescent mental health. Um, it was also my first experience kind of completing or at least leading a funding application um, and then also receiving uh, peer review feedback on the application. And the ResNet Awards are a really fantastic opportunity to collaborate across um, the other SP SPHR members. So um, for mine in particular, I collaborated with um, UCL and Fuse, um, one person being Emma, who we've recently heard from. Um, and yeah, that was just a really fantastic way to network with other East ECRs um, with an interest in public health. Um, so just a bit of background. So before I applied for the award, um, myself and colleagues at Bristol um, released a descriptive report around young people's mental health during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this report was one of very few that had um, pre-pandemic mental health data available. Um, so we were in quite a fortunate position, um, thanks to the fantastic work of Lizzie Winstone, who was a PhD student in SBHR at Bristol. Um, so we had some fantastic data with the ability to track change over time during the pandemic. Uh, and despite many studies, um, you know, looking at, well, studies at the time were reporting an increase in mental health difficulties early on in the pandemic for young people. But our report actually revealed an overall decrease in the risk of anxiety. Um, so one of the key findings from the study was the relationship between school and peer connectedness um, and what role that plays in student mental health. So um, we found that levels of mental health and well-being were consistently poorer for students who felt least connected to school and their peers before the pandemic. Um, and I've shown anxiety as an example in the two graphs um, on this slide, where students reporting feeling least connected to school and their peers are the green lines, so the top line on those graphs. And change over time in our findings were most prominent for anxiety, and um, with a decrease in anxiety during lockdown. And then we found an increase in anxiety when students returned to school. Um, and this increase was most pronounced for students reporting low school connectedness, um, which is the graph on the left. So there were some really interesting findings um, that perhaps I, I hadn't expected to come from the research. Um, and in terms of impacts and outputs, the ResNet Awards are a fantastic opportunity um, to do lots of great things in terms of academic papers um, and conferences. So I had the opportunity to lead two first author papers which have recently been published in peer-reviewed journals, um, as well as the results featuring in last year's in last year's um, Parliament Post note for policymakers. Uh, the quantitative study abstract was also published in The Lancet as part of last year's Public Health Science Conference. Um, and I was recently um, notified that the qualitative abstract of my work was accepted for the International Conference for Youth Mental Health um, in Copenhagen this autumn, which will be my first opportunity to um, present something in person, which will be lovely. Um, so as well as academic outputs, I also wanted to produce something that could be sent to schools and fed back to the young people who took part in the study. So I took my qualitative findings to a young person's advisory group um, who actually co-designed this poster with me. Um, it, I did start to do one myself and they significantly improved it and it reminded me of the um, huge benefits of young people giving you feedback on these things. So the group I worked with um, suggested a number of ways to promote this poster in schools uh, and even suggested having a focused lesson in school where adolescents can talk more about their experiences of lockdown and home learning um, and returning to school as, as a way of sharing their feelings with peers. Um, so this poster summarises my qualitative findings. Um, I won't go through all the detail. Um, this is available um, if people would like to read it in more detail. Um, so I spoke with 25 adolescents through a combination of individual interviews and focus groups. This was a bit of a mixed bag of um, online, um, in school um, and, you know, on the telephone or via Teams um, because of the pandemic. Um, so, sorry, it keeps <laughs> flicking. So, um, yeah, thinking about their own experiences, the three themes were, the first one was really the challenges of different learning environments. And um, interestingly, the challenges of the school environment came through quite strongly there, particularly around a sense of relief 
um, when the initial lockdown happened and schools closed for the first time. And that was a lot to do with bullying, um, challenging peer relationships, large class sizes um, and feeling quite overwhelmed at school. And learning at home, um, this was very different for different individuals, as we might expect, um, depending on their home environment. So some people found themselves doing much more work than they did in school, um, whereas others felt they couldn't focus. Um, they may have had a large number of siblings, um, no access to a quiet space. And then there was lots and lots. I think probably the overwhelmingly um, overwhelming thing that came out of this finding was friendships, the importance of friendships, spending time with peers your age, uh, but particularly face to face. Um, so there was a really th there was a sense that young people stayed really well connected online and that offered lots of social opportunities. Um, however, they really, really missed um, seeing their friends face to face. And then dealing with change, um, I think young people struggled with the constant changes, uncertainty around exams. I spoke with kind of year nines and um, that went into year 10. So there was lots of anxiety around exam unknowns around exams um, and there was lots of increased anxiety when going back to school um, I think although young people were really keen to see their friends um, they were really apprehensive about being with lots of people again um, lots of different changes in the school environment looked very very different and then finally there were lots of coping strategies um, offered so they offered advice to friends and um, they were talking about um, the need to kind of take it slowly have lots of breaks at school and the chance to kind of have this social catch up um, as well as academic catch up. Um, so just very briefly in terms of implications. So I, I think the study really summarises the need for focus on students overall health and wellbeing in school as well as the academic catch up. Um, a really interesting emerging area of research into school and peer connectedness and how that impacts on student mental health. Um, and a continued understanding of the negative aspects of the school environment impacting on mental health. Um, but really um, the, the value, just the huge value young people place on um, social interactions and perhaps that's not fully met online. Uh, and just to say, yeah, there's been lots of really great ongoing collaborations that I'm involved in. Um, and these are actually international collaborations, which is really fantastic. So it's linking up with people uh, with similar interests, academics across several other institutions across the world um, who have similar interests, which has been a really brilliant um, opportunity from the award as well. Um, in terms of next steps, hopefully I'm on time, um, I aim to um, apply and submit a PhD by published work, um, focusing on adolescent mental health and wellbeing in particular, which this um, ResNet award has really helped me um, to be able to shape and make stronger. Uh, and then in the future, um, I hope to apply for a fellowship application. Again, um, adolescent mental health and wellbeing is, is my particular area of interest. So I'd love to do some more work in um, school-based policy and intervention in the future. And yes, happy to take questions. Great, thank you so much indeed, um, Emily, for that really interesting uh, presentation. Um, so um, one of the things that um, that happened after you did that work was that there was a lot of press interest in it at the time. Um, and um, I wonder if you can just say a little bit about how you felt about that and, and, and how you managed it. Yeah, um, it was actually my first experience of press interest um, from research. And it was lovely, but it was really challenging because I think I, I hadn't, it was um, met with, it became slightly political and I really struggled with that um, because unfortunately it was great to see the findings and I think when I saw it on BBC News I didn't realise it was our research and I just thought it looked really interesting but unfortunately it was um, I think it was put up the same day that they'd made a really strong statement that the best place for children to be was schools and I, I very much agree with that statement but unfortunately my findings uh, were were looking at a reduction in anxiety um, during lockdown. And I, it just led to some really interesting but quite tricky discussions on live, um, you know, live interviews. And I think what it, what it reminded me is that you have to be really confident in what you're saying about your research and your findings, but it's really important when dealing with press not, not to get kind of pulled into more political statements because um, they, they like juicy headlines, don't they? So I think I was very aware to try and not get pulled down that route. Um, but it was fantastic. It was really great. And it's so lovely to see press interest in research. Um, but 
yeah, you just have to be careful with the headlines, I think. <laughs> Indeed. Great. And some lovely comments coming in on the chat about your presentation and a question from Ashley. Uh, what advice would you give uh, to people in building their networks? Yeah, um, it was really hard early on because I, I started at Bristol University in the pandemic and um, it, it's, it's really challenging to meet people. Um, I perhaps annoyingly um, quite often found people that perhaps had similar interests and just popped them an email. And uh, yeah, I it was um, death by virtual coffees, perhaps, but um, <laughs> I think just reaching out to people with similar interests. The ResNet, as well as the ResNet Awards, there's also a ResNet community, um, and it's really important to try and reach out to those, um, their names, and I think that community is all published online on the SBHR website, so it's really helpful to kind of look at what people are up to, and even if they don't share similar interests it's nice to just chat about things like applications whereabouts they are experience um and things like that so i'd say just just contacting and reaching out and now hopefully um conferences will happen in person so that's another brilliant opportunity to meet people yeah indeed great okay so uh thank you so much uh emily for for, for, for that presentation and please keep posting uh, if you've got questions for emily or for any of other our other speakers uh this morning please do post them in the chat and uh, and they can answer them there for you um but we're just going to to move on to one more more thing this morning um but before we do that i do want to thank all of our fantastic speakers uh, this morning um, for their for their amazing presentations. And I think it is important, um, as Emily's really just been reminding us of the context um, for much of this work, because um, as I said earlier, our capacity development programme um, started some way into the second quinquennium. And so all of our trainees have been um, affected and challenged by the pandemic. And you can see, um, you know, despite that, that they've produced work of the, of the highest quality um, and indeed, as Emily has shown um, and others, you know, contributed to our to our understanding of the impact of, of, of COVID-19. And I'd also just um, like to take this opportunity um, to thank my colleagues, um, Susan Bowett and Andy Sill, who um, provide amazing support to, to the Research Capacity uh, Development Programme um, organisationally and, and, and supporting all, all of the all of our trainees uh, so well so so my, my thanks um uh, them and also to katie appleby who does a lot of work um making sure that the the, the findings are translated um into uh different different outputs um and and, and, the, and they, get, they get out there okay so for the final part of this morning um i just want to uh, share my screen again and uh talk about the public health incubator so just bear with me for a second while i do that okay so um you may not uh, entirely, so I just wanted to really explain what, what this public health incubator is. We have um, some received some modest funding um, from the NIHR um, to uh, try and stimulate and inspire um, those who are already, who may already be working in public health uh, in, in, in the academic or the practice field. Um, but we also want to encourage um, folk from other uh, areas into um, public health um, and to pursuing academic careers and we want to do that um, through through better signposting um, to funding opportunities and to um, where career support is is available and so um, the the objectives that, that that we have are really to to raise awareness um, and to enhance the opportunities of people who want to pursue uh, careers in academic uh, public health. Um, we want to, um, as I've just said, engage and, and actively reach out to a range of um, professional groups and disciplines from, from wider public health, thinking about things like folk like engineers and architects 
and people working um, in, in social care um, who also have um, valuable skills to, to bring to the to the field um, in addition to people coming from uh, more familiar academic disciplines like sociology or psychology. Um, we also want to raise um, the profile of um, academic um, public health research careers um, by working um, with uh, funder with funders um, and with uh, policy and practice organizations and uh, we also want to try and find out what the barriers are um, to those um, who are already working in public health who wish to pursue a research career and to try and do something to to to, to tackle those so um, we are organized into, uh, we have a steering committee. I co-chair the incubator with um, Professor Carol Brain, who is um, the lead um, for Cambridge within the School for Public Health Research. Um, we have an administrator, actually, I'm sorry to say that the, the, the name there is wrong. It is, is now Judith, Judith Willows, um, who's just taken over from, from Rebecca Hill. Um, and as you can see there, we have a very um, august a steering committee um, with lots of people representing different different parts of, of public health uh, research and practice. Um, and uh, we have, uh, we've been meeting uh, regularly um, and our work plan has involved um, developing a slide set with, with key information about all of the opportunities that are available to people who want to pursue a career in public health research. We've also been um, acquiring case histories of people who've come into public health research through a variety of, of different routes. Um, and we are now, um, we now uh, have a, a website where we're, we're using, uh, we're, we're populating it with all of that information. Um, and um, we are evolving subgroups to, to tackle specific areas that we've identified um, where further work is, is needed and global public health is one of those. So we have a subgroup on that. And in the future, we are hoping to uh, organize a series of events to provide um, information um, and networking opportunities um, for people who, who wish to uh, pursue careers in academic public health. And so um, it's my pleasure to, to, to soft launch this morning um, our website. Um, for the public health incubator, um, it's still still under under development, but um, we 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 are getting we're getting there with that, um, and, and and this is the, the the landing page here for 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 the website. And as you can see, we've we've got case histories and lots of um, what we hope will be useful signposting information and advice on the website. And um, our web domain, which is here, um, hopefully is really easy uh, to, to remember. Um, and so uh, we, we hope that this will, will uh, help in encouraging people uh, into the field. And I should, should mention um, that I'm doing that here um, this morning because the uh, incubator is part of the School for Public Health Research but reaches um, beyond the School for Public Health Research, as you could see by, by the, the people in the committee. So um, do, 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 do visit our, our website when, when, it, when it's fully up and running. And um, we hope to see some of you um, at, at, at our events um, so that you can uh, tell them your stories and encourage them uh, into the field. So um, that's the end of the session this morning. Um, we're going to go into a break now um, until um, 11 o'clock. So um, please, please, I'm sorry, I apologize, we're just a couple of minutes over, but um, please do come back um, at 11 o'clock um, for, for the next part of the conference. So uh, enjoy your coffee and we'll see you back here at 11. Thanks very much. <laughs>